So first of all, you have to learn the trade before learning the tricks of the trade. This is what hmm. I tell my students. Just 24 hours a day. You are doing surgeries, you are having travel plans, you are giving international presentations. How do you manage time? Time management is everything in life. Like it's not about the time and it's also about the mind management. Like when you are doing the surgery, you are fully into it. When you are with family, you are fully with the family. It is about compartmentalization. Mm. So you need to kind of then you enjoy what you're doing and then success automatically come in, comes mm. in. You know, money is secondary. Mm -hmm. So my advice to the uh, younger generation is don't think about money, don't go after money. How LASIK works in the treatment of myopia? See, LASIK basically is laser in situ keratomy uses. Most of these patients are also in the rural areas mm. and they don't know that a surgery can cure them. Hmm. So there's illiteracy, lack of knowledge, hmm. also there is difficult to access eye care. Myopia and cataracts are major eye concerns in India right now. The way Virat Kohli is referred in cricket, a legend, same way Dr. Shri Ganesh is in ophthalmic field. He is one of the fastest surgeon in the world and he has been nicknamed as Feko Maverick. He is the founder of Netradhama Super Speciality Eye Hospitals which are located in Karnataka. Has done 1,30,000 cataract surgeries and more than 80,000 refractive surgeries. He has more than 120 research publications. He is on the advisory board of major manufacturers and he is guiding them to take on better path and making that innovation accessible to every patient. So let's welcome him. First of all, sir, thank you so much for accepting my invitation and making time for this podcast from your busy schedule. It's been an honor for me that you are sitting in front of me and I think like this podcast will be going to be a very very insightful talk with you we will get to know about your personal stories your experiences your success stories your challenges you faced and a bit technical information for the patients regarding cataracts and myopia thank you so much sir for accepting my invitation thank you it's my pleasure thank you sir so sir uh as I was uh, reading about you. You have started your clinic in 1994 and then you came to eight hospital chains in Karnataka in two, uh, 2024. So sir, this must be an amazing journey. So please tell me something about this journey. Like how was it? Well, uh, there's always an interesting story. And uh, I was actually a very good student, uh, both in uh, MBBS and MS. I got the gold medal in uh, second year MBBS and final year MBBS, and also in MS for the university. Mm -hmm. But then during our times in the 90s, uh, doctors were not paid very well. And uh, I could not land a decent job. I mean, we were getting salaries of 3,000 rupees or 3,500 which was something that a plumber or a mason would get. Mm -hmm. So it was not really kind of worth taking up those jobs. So I decided I will start off on my own. Mm -hmm. So in 94, I started in a small clinic. It's a one-room clinic. And uh, even to get equipment was difficult because I had to kind of beg or borrow mm -hmm. because I didn't have a balance sheet. Mm -hmm. And uh, the bank does not give you a loan if you don't have... Uh, you know, steady income and a balance sheet. Mm -hmm. So I had to borrow from uh, parents, relatives. And uh, there was a small house. It was a residential house, which uh, my father had given on rent and mm -hmm. the tenant left. And so I asked him, um, if you can give me the house rent free, rent free for six months, then I can set up my clinic there. And of course, my parents supported me. Mm -hmm. And I started my clinic. I was very confident because... I knew my subject. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, I started among uh, very big players, um, big hospitals in and around me. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I was quite confident that I would make it. And uh, I remember during the 
inauguration of my clinic also i had to hear a lot of comments hmm. in the sense that oh don't worry you'll always get those patients who keep going around to all clinics because you know they have conditions like optic atrophy or retinitis pigmentosa hmm. and all that but then uh, yes uh, i kind of put in all the hard work mm-hmm. and initially when i started i didn't have any assistants so i used to clean the ot myself i used to clean my instruments uh sterilize them myself of course my wife helped mm. and we both used to sit and scrub the oti in the evenings and uh, so it was a sm- small beginning that i started very humble beginnings but then you know my dedication to this profession mm-hmm. and to my patients helped and over a period of years you know the practice grew i was always uh, techno savvy and i embraced all the new technologies mm-hmm. in fact uh, when i couldn't afford it also i got one of the i was one of the first to start phaco emulsification okay. phaco emulsification for cataract okay uh, so i started that in 95 just one year after i had started my practice mm-hmm. and then i was getting like four five patients to operate in a month mm-hmm. but i took the risk invested in a machine got the machine mm. and then started off and that was a turning point in my career mm. and uh, i was very good with doing cataract surgery with phaco emulsification there were very few surgeons who were offering it routinely mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then uh, i started topical anesthesia in fact i probably i was one of the first or the first to start topical anesthesia that is without injection stitches or bandage in mm-hmm. karnataka and then patients by word of mouth and uh, the results they started coming mm-hmm. in and the practice started growing and then i also invested in a lasik machine Hmm. where even the big practices had not invested so you borrowed that money to yes. introduce that lasik I machine i borrowed uh, money from a cooperative bank paying very high interest hmm. and uh, it was around uh, 400000 us dollars at that time hmm. and it mine was a small practice so hmm. the distributor for this machine it was called the chiron or then bosch and lom took over this company hmm. and uh, when i sent an email to them asking them to send a quotation for the machine i didn't get any reply again for repeat emails there was no reply so i had to call them up and ask them are you in the business of selling lasers because if you are in the business of selling hmm. i'm interested in buying one hmm. and then immediately they came down and i remember we we sat in uh, holiday in now it's mm. lee meridian okay. and uh, up till 2 am in the morning and finalized the deal mm. and they say that was the fastest deal that they have done mm-hmm. so i took a lot of risks also but mm. then i was trained in lasik in the us under dr john shepherd he was one of the pioneers in okay. cataract and lasik okay and uh, they were doing the fda studies when i was there doing a observer fellowship with okay. him okay and i knew my uh, stuff and my art hmm. and craft so you was uh, also doing ghost surgeries for your professors i heard that yes when i was uh, a student mm-hmm. uh, i was quite skilled and mm-hmm. talented so many of my pro- professors used to get even their private patients mm. operated by me mm. and uh, in fact as a student i have done all varieties of surgeries mm. i had done um, cataracts retinal detachment squint mm. um over 150 intraocular lenses then as a student in those times where only you know the three or four of them were implanting mm. lenses lenses in the, in the early 90s okay and uh, so i actually enjoyed my post graduation mm. and uh, i was actually a complete surgeon by the time i finished mm. so i was very confident uh, of starting practice and uh, because i couldn't actually land a decent job hmm. uh, now i'm thankful that i didn't get a good <laughs> you didn't job. get a decent job <laughs> <laughs> and i started my practice and then it has grown yeah. now uh, we just opened our ninth hospital okay in whitefield okay and so that's uh, very beautiful there are a lot of initiatives i mean it's not only the uh, looking after patients of course the patient is the core of our practice hmm so everything revolves around the patient patient satisfaction results hmm. but we are also into education and educative initiatives we mm-hmm. have a residency in ophthalmology the dnb which mm-hmm. is a 3 year course okay after mbbs um, mm-hmm. by the national board mm-hmm. and then we have post doctoral fellowships mm-hmm. in different specialties like uh, phaco refractive surgery 
glaucoma, retina. Mm-hmm. So people come from all over the country and even abroad to train now. Okay. So at any time we have about 30 fellows uh, mm-hmm. with us who are training. Who are training per that. year. In uh, different uh, specialties. Okay. So every year, about uh, eight to ten fellows okay. pass out. Pass out. But it's like a two-year course, okay. uh, postdoc fellowships. And this is affiliated to the Rajiv Gandhi Health Sciences University. So okay. this is something that we are doing. We also have a BSc in uh, optometry and okay. an MOPT, okay. which we uh, have uh, the Netradama School of Optometry. So, so this sir. is for uh, paramedical uh, mm. Uh, training like optometrists, uh, the primary care people in eye care. Mm. So they actually do the refraction and vision testing mm. and all those tests before the doctor sees. So I can patient. say that it's not just the hospital, it's a full institution which yes, is also giving education to the doctors also. It's giving like courses in optometry also. Yes. Mm. So and we also have short term training programs Okay. and observership. So we have people from all over the world coming in because mm-hmm. uh, we have some of the cutting edge technologies first time in the world first time mm-hmm. in india kind mm-hmm. of technology so mm-hmm. they come and observe and learn mm-hmm. so it is actually very fulfilling i mean to even teach so mm-hmm. because i am very interested in teaching and training mm-hmm. because if you alone are actually good and operating on patients then there's only a particular number of patients mm-hmm. that you can treat but if you're teaching somebody then it spreads. Yes. So uh, right now I have over 200 fellows whom I have trained mm. and they are all doing good work. So it is, mm. it keeps multiplying. And So uh, you are the perfect example of just follow your passion. Like the path will lead to somewhere. Yes. If you love what you do, mm. then there's a saying that you don't have to work a single day in yeah. your life. Mm. So if you love what you do, then you enjoy what you're doing. <laughs> and then success automatically come in, comes mm. in. You know, money is secondary. Mm-hmm. So my advice to the uh, younger generation is don't think about money. Don't go after money. Mm. Think about how you can be good at what you're doing and give your best. Give your best. The money is secondary. It will automatically come in. You don't have to bother mm. about it. Exactly, sir. So, like with experience of like more than 1,40,000 cataract surgeries, 80,000 LASIK surgeries, refractive surgeries you have done. So, sir, there must be a lot of challenges you have faced during this span of like experience. So, sir, what are the major challenges a doctor faces? There are a lot of challenges, especially when you embrace new technology. One is the cost of the technology. Mm -hmm. And then you have to know how to use the technology optimally. Mm. And if something goes wrong, you should be able to handle it. Something goes wrong with the machine or during the procedure, you should know how to handle it. So these are all challenges which are there. Even purchasing the equipment again, Mm. because doctors are not very good businessmen. We are never taught about uh, business or business Mm. skills Mm. during our course. We just taught about how to treat patients. Treat, treat patients. And uh, so our focus is basically on the patient. Hmm. So this is again a challenge because these equipment, they're very expensive. Hmm. They're very expensive and then you have to invest. Hmm. And then there ha- also has to be a return on investment. If there is hmm. no return on investment, then the whole project will fail. Hmm. So that is where you need to be uh, kind of, uh, you have to understand what patients want, the patient's hmm. needs, whether there'll be a demand Mm. And how kind of, what kind of pricing you can kind of uh, apply to this treatment. Mm. And uh, those are the few challenges because mm. we are not very well versed with that. Mm. With that business acumen. Yes. Because doctors are trained for the treating patients. patients. They are yes. focusing on that patient satisfaction. Okay. So, sir, uh, when it comes to finances, as you were saying, like it is a very expensive for the upcoming doctors so sir what advice you will give to the young ophthalmologists who are selecting this field that how they will manage their finances and which will help them turn their hospitals run efficiently so first of all you have to learn the trade before learning the tricks of the trade this is what Hmm. i tell my students because uh, if you are very good at your trade Hmm. at your craft and then you are able to give those outcomes which mm. the patients expect. Then automatically the patients come in, the volumes come in. Mm. And uh, it is a win-win situation. Mm. You will have to assess the needs of the patient. Mm. And 
I always say, see what you can afford to give your patients, not what the patients can afford to pay you. <laughs> if you can afford to get that equipment and give that service, and then it's very good, then mm. automatically the patients also will be willing to pay for mm. the services. Pay for the services, exactly. And sir, plus, what are the skills they need? When you are doing a surgery, it is a very tough job because someone's life is in your hands so sir there must be a skill which separates best great doctors from the yes because you cannot get actually involved too much in emotions hmm. you have to be very clinical when you are dealing with a patient mm -hmm. okay but you should have the empathy you should have the empathy and the compassion I have operated on a lot of VIP patients. Hmm. Most of the governors of Karnataka I have operated. I have operated on film stars. I have operated on my own parents and grandparents and hmm. my relatives, my sister, hmm. my children also. I have done uh, smile for my daughter. Okay. So when I actually see the eye, it's just the eye. Hmm. It is not the person behind or my relationship or hmm. all that. So all that doesn't come into my head. It's just that when I see the eye, it's like Mahabharata. Hmm. You know the story yes. when um, uh, Arjuna, Drona, is, yeah, Drona asks yeah, Arjuna yeah. as to what you see. <laughs> then he says, I see only the eye of the parrot. <laughs> so you have to be very focused. If, you're, hmm. if your mind is not focused, then you will not be able to deliver and do a good job. So focus is very important in this profession, especially as a surgeon. Hmm. And to have the right mental attitude. Mm. So sometimes, you know, surgery is a very fluid situation. Things can kind of go wrong. Machines may not work or patients may not respond exactly as you want them to. Mm. So it's a very fluid situation. So you should be able to adapt. Mm. And this is what I call the algorithm of the surgery. So you know step by step, okay, if this, is, this step happens, then I go on to the next step. If mm -hmm. there is a problem, then... I will take an alternate route. <laughs> so this is what I tell my students. Hmm. So if you have a complication during surgery, it's mm -hmm. just a change in your surgical plan. Mm -hmm. Don't get mentally flustered about it. Mm -hmm. And if you have your surgical algorithm cut out for you, then you will know exactly what to do. Mm -hmm. So when you know what to do, you're not nervous mm -hmm. or you don't get the jitters. Mm -hmm. So you can proceed. It's just like you have a roadblock Google will give you another direction mm -hmm. and you finally reach your destination. Mm -hmm. So you have to keep your calm. For a surgeon, you have to be very calm. Mm -hmm. So they say a surgeon should have the eyes of a hawk, a heart of a lion and the fingers of a lady. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the qualities. This, this is what our professors used to tell us when we were <laughs> students. But I think it is very true. Mm -hmm. So sir, like one question, like you are a biker, then you like to sing. Then you are an avid traveler, you are a fitness freak, you are a great surgeon. Every person is having that limited time, just 24 hours a day. You are doing surgeries, you are having travel plans, you are giving international presentations. How do you manage time? Time management is everything in life. You know, most people have stress because they are not able to manage time. Mm -hmm. They are not able to kind of plan their activities and if they are not able to finish a particular activity then it gives rise to stress because the deadlines timelines and you're not able to finish that work and then you ha you're under tremendous stress mm. so time management is everything mm. so if you are able to kind of manage your time then you can have time for your profession you can have time for your health you can mm. have time for your family mm. and your hobbies mm. so this is uh, the work life balance mm. So you will have to learn about this during your early stage in the profession mm -hmm. because with medicine, it's a very hectic schedule mm. and there's a lot of stress. In mm -hmm. fact, there's a saying that most of the drug addiction, suicides, divorces mm. happen among doctors mm. because that's because it's a very stressful job. Mm. You're working sometimes like 14, 16 hours a day. Mm. You know, and then especially some of the um, other specialties like anesthesiology or mm. neurosurgery or gynecology, obstetrics, mm. you, you're working almost around the clock. And then speciali specialities like ophthalmology, we don't have so many emergencies. Mm. So it's much easier to plan our time. Mm. And you have to be efficient. You will have to look at the workflow. Mm. 
it's called workflow efficiency mm. so you train your staff you also embrace technology to help you mm. so that you can do a get a lot of work done in a short period of time so it's mm. not about working hard it's about working smart smart and uh, this is something that i have learned and for example my cataract surgeries i do about 15 cataract surgeries in an hour okay and there are surgeons who take you know one hour to just do one surgery one surgery so if you're able to efficiently manage your time mm. then you and use your staff and your support Mm. efficiently then you can get a lot done mm. so i work 9 to 5 mm. i don't work very long hours mm. because i need time for my fitness i yeah. need time for you know making my presentations making my talks for conferences mm. Mm. and also i need time for my family mm. and uh, i'm able to manage it in in the given time we only mm-hmm. have everybody has 24 hours sir what insight you have given me is like it's not about the time and it's also about the mind management like when you are doing the surgery you are fully into it when you are with family you are fully with the family it is about compartmentalization hmm. so you need to kind of compartmentalize and be in the moment that's hmm. very important as a surgeon it is very important that you don't think about anything else mm-hmm. when you are doing your surgery mm-hmm. you have to be 100% focused on the eye on the patient mm. in fact we play music in our ot so the mm. patient also is calm mm. and the flow goes on very mm. easily there's no there are no distractions phones are not allowed in the operation theater mm. it's completely focused on the patient and when you're with your family you have to focus and be there along with the family mm. have conversations with them have mm. dinner with them mm. you shouldn't be on your laptop doing your emails mm. so you have to plan time for every activity so when you have of course you need to also set aside time for your health mm. if you go to the gym then you are focused there you put off your phone you don't answer your phone mm. you just do that activity you can mm. always the other things come in later you can always message people so it's not that and many people are always on their phones looking at social media or messages yes. or chatting that's a problem we fa- we see today and that is very distracting mm. because then you are not able to be in the moment mm. if you are not in the moment then you don't enjoy your life the secret is to be in the moment mm. whatever you are doing you have to be focused focused at because that. that moment is everything that you have mm. once it is gone it's no longer there mm. so we are not using like technology as a tool we are using it as a destructive forces of our uh, for our mind also like we are wasting our time and we are damaging our brain like it's a saying like what you put in that comes out you put the garbage in the garbage comes out sir even uh, you have a nickname of a fake maverick is that because you do surgery within 2 and 1/2 minutes i do things differently i have my own techniques <laughs> and uh, so yes i kind of got the name nickname fake maverick <laughs> even my email is like fake maverick that's why it's uh, like that and uh, yes i am i am a little different from the other surgeons mm-hmm. i have a lot of innovations also <laughs> because when i look at something i have alternative thinking whether this can be done in a different way can it be done better <laughs> and i have uh, invented a lot of instruments i have <laughs> patents even for a new intraocular lens okay. so some of these devices uh, are not perfect <laughs> but you know the thinking is that it is we always think in boundaries <laughs> so when i say a for automatically you think apple apple because the human mind is tuned and trained Mm. for what we are taught from childhood mm. we don't think about anything else a can be there for so many things but mm. as soon as you say it a mm. it's for apple because you have been trained the mind yes. has been trained mm. so our thinking is like it's like putting blinders to a horse mm. so we only kind of think in our boundary we mm. don't go out of that boundary we are creating a box yes you are creating a box and you are confining yourself to the box mm. so once you think out of the box mm. literally then you have a lot of innovations and you can get you know new ideas and do things differently and mm. that's what set you sets you apart mm. and uh, that's how I, i actually in primary school i was not a very good student because the teacher wanted verbatim 
you know the same thing that they told you need to buy heart and then tell them i was never able to do that i am never able to read from a script hmm. i want to just speak my mind yes and hmm. uh, i want to form my own sentences hmm. so that's always been my funda from uh, <laughs> hmm. when i was a child and <laughs> so, so you were like said. thinking out of the box since childhood and that's the like you can say that's a secret that's a secret you have got the key so are you following spirituality yes uh, i am uh, more of a spiritual person than a religious person okay so i believe in a higher force hmm i also like to connect to the cosmos i take my time for meditation which is hmm. very important and hmm. i feel everybody if they just meditate 15 minutes a day it's very difficult to reach 15 minutes hmm. because your thoughts are you know your head is full of thoughts yes. and it's so distracting hmm. so if you are able to kind of set aside even 15 minutes for meditation mm. then your mind calms down mm. and uh, it's so much easier you're so much more relaxed mm. so, so the calmer is, the mind the better the surgeon will be yes for a surgeon you have to be very calm mm. you have to be calm you have to be patient mm. so sir what what's your morning routine looks like morning i usually wake up early i go to bed early i i sleep by 9:30 or so okay i get up by around uh, 5 5:30 mm-hmm. then i finish my morning ablutions and then after that i do some of my emails mm-hmm. and uh, go through some of my messages mm-hmm. because uh, whole day i'm working i don't really i'm not constantly on my phone mm-hmm. so th- uh, then i do that and maybe a little bit of reading and then i go for a walk okay uh, i walk for about an hour mm. and uh, before i used to go for a run mm. Uh, but now i just kind of go for a walk it's quite relaxing we have mm. the botanical garden near our house lalba okay so i just go there for a walk come back mm. uh, talk to my wife have breakfast and then uh, i start surgeries by 9 o'clock 9 o'clock okay and then i feel first i finish my cataract surgeries and mm. then i have a short break mm. relax for some time and then do some half an hour administrative or financial work mm. because we have about 600 staff nine hospitals now mm. so staff come to me at that time and then after that i go and finish my refractive surgeries lasik mm-hmm. so on an average i do about 25 30 surgeries a day mm. uh, before it was more i've done as many as nearly 90 surgeries a day but okay. uh, and on an average i used to do about 40 surgeries a day now i've actually cut down cut down my work uh, because of course my other colleagues and juniors also have to do mm. more work so it is i do mainly the premium surgeries mm-hmm. and of course the complex cases mm. and then after my refractive surgery then i have outpatient for about an hour and a half i see about 15 20 patients mm. and then i'm kind of done then uh, usually i go we have a gym in the hospital mm. so i go there and then work out for about 45 minutes so you are so. fond of a yoga also yes okay so sometimes i kind of do yoga uh in the evenings hmm. after i go home okay so, and then after the gym i have some you again any other meetings or administrative hmm. issues and normally by about 5 5:30 i pack up and go home okay then i just relax and <laughs> then have time for some reading hmm. or other activities <laughs> spend time with the family hmm. i have an early dinner i eat about by about 7 o'clock okay And so so that's a, that's also the key like i have i've read somewhere that like if you want to stay fit na you should have your dinner like before 7:30 pm so like you should have 2 hours to digest that food is that generally yes because when you sleep on a full stomach hmm. there is regurgitation okay so the food actually comes back into the food pipe okay and you can have acid reflux and all those problems mm-hmm. so it's ideal to kind of eat about 3 hours before you sleep so if you are if you are sleeping by before 10 o'clock then by 7 o'clock you, you finish your meal meal and uh, then you can do your other activities mm. and then sleep by 9:30 10 so you you're comfortable you get a good night sleep mm. so that's uh, what i follow so now let's move on to uh, that major concern in india which is myopia 
what do you think what's the major reason like we indians are having this kind of a problem it's not only india hmm. it is a global issue okay. it's known as the myopia epidemic okay now most of the health problems hmm. are lifestyle problems okay. so this is what people have to realize hmm. and instead of turning to medicines hmm. okay they need to actually look inward at their lifestyle hmm as to what they are eating what are their habits what are their practices mm. and these are the things that are giving rise to illness <laughs> anything you take diabetes hypertension cardiac problems mm. they are all lifestyle myopia is multifactorial mm-hmm. of course you can have myopia because of hereditary problems <laughs> um if the parents are myopic then there is a chance like a 50% chance that the child can be myopic okay that's one of the reasons mm. but then you see even if the parents are okay the child is myopic nowadays mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's again because of excessive screen time mm-hmm, mm-hmm. human eyes are not made to see computers or screens for a very long time mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you start accommodating and then there is a natural response mm-hmm. because you are seeing something very close for a long period of time mm-hmm. you develop short sight so with children during the growth phase Hmm. if they are constantly on phone on computers then this can affect their eyesight cause myopia okay. so that is environmental and lifestyle issues also apart from the genetic okay. uh, probability of undergoing mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. having uh, myopia hmm. so this actually has become an epidemic after computers have come in after mobile phones have come in you can see most children become addicted to screens either they are playing video games or they are on social media hmm. or using computers for learning hmm. ipads for learning and during the covid period they were all online classes hmm. so we actually saw a jump in uh, the myopia and even progression of myopia people wearing okay. glasses the power hmm. increased i mean the children wearing glasses the hmm. power increased so this is definitely a lifestyle issue and before we used to see it mainly in the um asia pacific region you know singapore japan these are countries where uh, they have high myopia mm-hmm. even china mm. india also and even in the western nations where they had long sight more of long sight mm. now they are having more of short sight now mm. so this is the, called the global myopia epidemic. epidemic and this is because of lifestyle also nutrition mm. so nutrition also if if the child does not have proper nutrition Hmm. the child cries they want junk food they get addicted hmm. because of all the contents there hmm. and uh, then parents also to keep them quiet they keep feeding them junk food and then this leads to lot of problems hmm. obesity hmm. malnutrition and even you know you need the essential vitamins from fruits and vegetables hmm. very important for proper development of uh, vision hmm. so if that is lacking then also it is a problem problem and children nowadays don't you hardly see children playing in the street or on the uh, mm. or in the playground yes. most of them after they come back from school they're again on their mm. computers so this also causes a problem you okay. need sunlight at least 20 to 30 minutes of sunlight okay every day mm-hmm. for uh, because no, it's not only the vitamin d production mm-hmm. but also you know for what is known as a circadian rhythm mm-hmm. because blue light Mm. Uh, in the ultraviolet light is very important for normal sleep wake cycle mm. and sleep is very important for normal development of all the organs mm. including your brain so yeah. this is very important children don't get enough sleep again because their sleep cycle is disturbed mm. they are w- watching tv or they are on the screen late night so all these are lifestyle issues okay so all these problems finally boil down to lifestyle and then if there is a change in the lifestyle then automatically we will see all these problems coming down coming down but now because of this epidemic we see more and more children wearing glasses when i was studying in school uh, there were only like a couple of kids wearing glasses and we used to always tease them and make mm. fun of them mm. now more than 50% of the gla- uh, class are wearing glasses glasses uh, and we are seeing this increasing and by 2050 it is said that almost 50% of the human population will be myopic okay 
So that is actually worrying. And uh, sometimes myopia can progress. If it's high myopia, more than six diopters, hmm. then you have other problems. You can have retinal issues like retinal detachment okay. and other issues. So hmm. it's, uh, you know, very important to kind of be aware of this. Hmm. At Netadama, we have actually launched a myopia clinic. Hmm. Uh, it's a special clinic where we can screen children. We have an uh, instrument, special instrument called the Myopia Master. Hmm. It checks the not only the power, but the curvature of the eyeball, the length of the eyeball, all hmm. the parameters. And it also gives you a chart of myopia progression. Okay. So there are some treatments to reduce the progression of myopia. Hmm. So you have special glasses. Hmm. These are gl uh, glasses with lens slits, hmm. which cause peripheral defocus. So this actually has found to reduce the progression of myopia. Mm -hmm. You also have drops like low-dose atropin drops. This also prevents the progression of myopia. Mm, progression so of then myopia. we do the assessment and then actually the chart gives us the progression without mm. treatment and with treatment. When the child is around 18 years, what will be the final mm. power? Mm. And uh, so regularly we need to keep checking every six months once mm. and then we put them on treatment and also counsel them about the lifestyle hmm. and um, use of screens, about nutrition, about getting sunlight, mm -hmm. all these things. And uh, this is something, this is an initiative that we have started. Hmm. And, so that's uh, a very good initiative. And we that's will be connecting school eye screening programs. We go hmm. to the schools. Okay. Connect mm. school and children who are in need of further assessment, they are referred to the myopia clinic. Mm. So we do a full assessment, put them on treatment. Hmm. So that at least we can prevent them from going in for a high myopia. Okay. So sir, as far as uh, LASIK is concerned, how LASIK works in the treatment of myopia? See, LASIK basically is laser in situ keratomeliosis. Okay. Where we use an excimer laser. Mm -hmm. First, a flap is made in the okay. cornea. The cornea is the front surface of the eye. Mm. So a flap is created either with a blade, with an instrument known as a microkeratome, okay. or with a laser, a femtosecond laser. Hmm. So we call that bladeless LASIK because we use a femtosecond laser to make a flap. Hmm. Then the flap is lifted. Then we use an excimer laser, a second laser called an excimer laser, which actually flattens the cornea. Okay. So once it flattens the cornea, then the rays of light actually, which are converging, diverge to focus on the retina. Okay. And so we are hmm. able to correct the myopia. So there is flattening of the cornea and focusing of light mm -hmm. so that the correction is achieved. Okay. So, sir, as far as uh, advancements are there, so, sir, what's the latest advancement against LASIK? So, the latest advancement is known as uh, Calyx or mm -hmm. uh, keratolenticular extraction. Okay. Um, the company names are Smile, Silk, Clear. So, they are different okay. companies which give different mm -hmm. names. Smile was the first... Okay. Procedure which started almost uh, 15 years ago. Okay. I've been doing it from 12 years. Okay. So this is a bladeless LASIK. Okay. And it is a flapless LASIK. So okay. we use only the femtosecond laser. Okay. The femtosecond laser carves a lenticule. Okay. A thin piece of tissue hmm. inside the eye and there is a very small 2 millimeter access incision mm -hmm. through which this lenticule is removed. So it is sir, not creating no, that flap? there is no flap. It is okay. flapless. Mm -hmm. So the problem is when you have a flap, you are cutting the corneal nerves. So you can have dryness. That is one thing. Mm -hmm. Second is uh, there is some amount of discomfort because you have to make a 20 millimeter cut, lift the flap, put back the flap. Mm -hmm. There is also a risk of Flap dislocation, if the patient touches the eye or rubs the eye. Mm -hmm. And also flap wrinkling, which can happen if you have not set the mm. flap correctly. These are all some of the issues. There are also other issues like epithelial ingrowth, etc. But uh, most of these flap-related problems are totally avoided once you have a flapless surgery. Flapless. Plus yes. for patients who want to play contact sports, say mm. football, boxing, Hmm. then you don't want a flap because the flap can dislocate if you have even minor trauma. Hmm. So this is very useful and the recovery also is much faster. Faster. With LASIK it takes a week, restrictions are there for a week. Here it's like 24 to 48 hours. Mm -hmm. After 24, 48 hours you can play sports, you can go to okay. the gym, you can shower, you can wash hmm. your face. So it's like after two days the person can? Yes. It is minimally invasive surgery. Okay. It's called minimally invasive surgery. Okay. 
So it's through a micro incision, through a two millimeter incision itself. Mm-hmm. And it's totally painless. So mm-hmm. The patient doesn't even feel it. And it's a very short procedure. Mm-hmm. It takes only about two minutes per eye. The laser itself takes about 10, 15 seconds. Okay. Uh, so sir, in this, we are also saving that time to make that flap. Yes. Is that? Yes, because there you need two lasers. You need mm-hmm. a femtosecond laser and an eczema laser. Mm-hmm. Here it's an all femtosecond la- uh, laser. So okay. it's only one laser. So the time taken is also much fast. Much faster, faster you than can finish the surgery quickly. Okay. So sir, there is an ICL, that implantable. Yes. There is also, see, there are different techniques to correct myopia. Okay. Or hypermetropia, okay. which is long side. Mm-hmm. These are the refractive disorders. And you have astigmatism, which is cylindrical power. Mm-hmm. So you can, the first procedure which came out was PRK, or mm-hmm. photorefractive keratectomy. Okay. Which basically uses an eczymer laser mm-hmm. to actually reshape the cornea on the surface. Mm-hmm. This was started in the 1980s. Mm-hmm. But this again, because there's a raw wound, which has to heal. It takes about 3-4 days to heal. We have to put a bandage contact lens. Risk of infection is more. And it is a painful procedure for about 3-4 days until the what we call the epithelium, the surface skin heals. Hmm. There's pricking, watering, pain. And uh, the visual recovery also is delayed. It takes about 3-4 weeks. And you have to use drops for a prolonged period of time. Okay, in PRK? In PRK. Okay. So after PRK, there was LASIK. Hmm. Where basically where you make a flap hmm. and give the laser. Hmm. And then came the KLX or SMILE procedure, hmm. Hmm. which is a totally flapless procedure so that the recovery is much faster. It's painless, less medication. Hmm. 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 And uh, you can get back to your activities. You can even do contact sports. and all. So these are the advantages. Now, for there are some patients who are not suitable for LASIK. What is the range? The range for keratorefractive procedures, either hmm. PRK, LASIK or SMILE, is anywhere from 0.5 to Minus 10. Okay. So beyond minus 10, double digits. Hmm. Again, very high myopia. Hmm. Laser is not advised because you have to remove a lot of tissue when you flatten the cornea. Hmm. And this can create problems. It can cause abrasions, poor hmm. quality of vision. And in the long term, it can weaken the cornea, cornea. and call, cause what is known as ectasia, hmm. which is very troublesome and difficult to manage. So hmm. generally, we don't like to treat more than minus 10. Hmm. And we need to kind of check all the parameters. We do what is known as a to- tomography, corneal mm-hmm. tomography, mm-hmm. which checks the curvature, mm-hmm. the thickness of the cornea, the front surface, back surface of the cornea, mm-hmm. creates a 3D map. So we can study that and see if the patient is suitable or not. Mm-hmm. And only if the patient is suitable, then we take them up for the procedure. If they are not suitable, then the alternative is fakic IULs okay. or what we call ICL, implantable contact lens or implantable collamer lens. lens. So there are a couple of companies making these lenses. Okay. These are very thin lenses, hmm. which we inject through a very small incision, like mm-hmm. a 2.8 millimeter incision. We inject the lens into the eye. It goes and sits under the iris, under the pupil, okay. in front of the natural lens. Okay. So it is invisible. You can't see it. Mm-hmm. And it focuses for all distances Distance. along with the natural lens. Okay. So you don't need glasses. The mm. advantage of this procedure is dryness is less. It's a reversible procedure. You can actually also remove or exchange the lens. Mm. So these are the advantages of the uh, ICL or fakic, fakic uh, mm. IULs. So we do, and for powers which are very high, like more mm. than minus 8, minus 10, mm. or the patient's cornea is not very thick, mm. then we can do these uh, lenses. Even otherwise, we can use it depending upon the patient's condition Mm. and their requirement. So we have what is known as comprehensive refractive solutions. Mm -hmm. So we have have PRK, we have LASIK. Mm -hmm. PRK, we have certain indications. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the surface skin is very weak, Mm -hmm. what we call basement membrane dystrophy. So for such patients, LASIK may not be safe. So for them specifically, we need to do a surface ablation or a PRK. PRK is known by a lot of names. Mm-hmm. Trans-PRK, um, advanced surface ablation, mm-hmm. epilasic. Mm-hmm. So there are a lot of names, but basically it is surface ablation. Okay. Where we use the laser directly on the corneal surface. Corneal surface. So in our hospital, we have comprehensive refractive solutions. We have PRK, we have LASIK, mm. uh, femtolasic, then we have smile, clear, Hmm. Which is which are the more advanced procedures, and we have fakic IULs also. Hmm. 
So and and for presbyopic patients, hmm. like patients over forty who wear reading glasses, yes, hmm. for them we have a treatment called Press Beyond. Okay. Which is an advanced type of LASIK. It's a customized advanced type of LASIK mm -hmm. where we can correct both distance and near. Okay. So I myself got it done about nine years ago. Okay. So I don't wear glasses. Mm. And uh, it's uh, we have to assess the patient and it's a very successful treatment. Mm. Because the general notion is that after 40 years, you cannot really do LASIK and you cannot correct the reading glasses. Mm. Mm. But with this technology, you can correct the both okay. the distance and reading glasses. Hmm. And so, sir, uh, in this procedure, we are also taking that corneal layer out of the we, eye. We remove some amount of corneal tissue and reshape the cornea. Okay. Okay. So, it is similar to LASIK. It's an advanced form of LASIK. Okay. For the uh, press biopia, biopia patients. patients. Patients over okay. 40 who require reading hmm. glasses. So, this is something that... Uh, so, we have all the techniques. So, we hmm. do an assessment of the patient. We look at their lifestyle. Hmm. We look at their eye. We look at their scans hmm. and then decide which is the best, safest procedure for them, hmm. which will give them a good correction hmm. and what all they need for their particular lifestyle. And then hmm. we discuss and then go ahead with that. So, okay. it's not that we have only one procedure hmm. that is only LASIK for everybody hmm. or only smile for everybody. <laughs> so depending upon the patient, we tailor the approach, Solutions. solution and some of them only fake IVLs or ICLs may be hmm. required. Hmm. So it depends completely on the patient, patient. and assessment of the patient. Hmm. So it's best to leave that decision to the doctor who is experienced. Hmm. So some patients come in and say, oh, my friend had LASIK, I want LASIK. Hmm. But they may not be a suitable candidate suitable for LASIK, candidate. but there's an alternative procedure which will hmm. give them as good a result. But mm. finally, they want to get rid of their glasses and they want to li live life without glasses. Mm. So, we can offer them a solution. So, if a person is like uh, facing a keratoconus, like then how LASIK will work? Keratoconus is a condition where the cornea starts becoming conical. Normally, it is spherical. Mm -hmm. So, it starts becoming thin and starts bulging and becoming conical. Mm -hmm. Usually, it's a progressive condition. Mm -hmm. That means it keeps on increasing, increasing. with age. And can be caused due to rubbing the eyes. So, that's okay. why we tell our patients not to rub the eye. Okay. Because it can lead to keratoconus. Okay. So, for keratoconus, again, these patients are not suitable for LASIK or SMILE. Okay. So, for them, we need to first stabilize the problem, the keratoconus. We do hmm. what is known as C3R. Okay. Or corneal collagen cross-linking, mm -hmm. where we put riboflavin drops, which is a vitamin, mm -hmm. and then give ultraviolet A radiation. So, what happens is cross linkage happens between the collagen fibers in the cornea and it becomes stiffer. So, it stops the progression of keratoconus. Mm. In moderate keratoconus, sometimes we may have to use what are known as intrastromal corneal rings. Mm. We put in very fine rings in the cornea. This actually stretches the cornea and flattens the cone okay. and improves the vision. Okay. These are all for early stage of keratoconus. And later on, for the residual power, we can do a fake IL or an ICL. Okay. So, that is mm. uh, something that we can do. Mm. In very advanced keratoconus, they have scarring of the cornea. Mm -hmm. In advanced keratoconus, these treatments will not work. We will have to do a corneal grafting and we have lamellar grafting, which you call as DALC, okay. deep anterior lamellar keratoplasty. Mm -hmm. So, the front layers of the cornea are removed and reinforced with the corneal graft. Okay. Okay. So, sir, as per as uh, like... ICLs are concerned. What's the best patient suitable for the ICL? Who is having like minus 10 diopter? This is the one uh, yes. criteria. See, for ICL, again, for any refractive procedure, the power has to be stable. So, mm -hmm. usually we do it in patients above 18 years. Okay. Preferably 20, 21 years. And their power should not have changed much mm -hmm. in one year. Mm -hmm. So, the change should be less than 0.5 mm -hmm. for them to be suitable. For Fake IULs, we need to actually look at what is known as the anterior chamber depth. Hmm. So, the they need a good anterior chamber depth which can accommodate the fake IUL okay. or the ICL. So, we do a scan and we need to take measurements for the lens. Hmm. So, there is there are few instruments which we use to take the measurements. Measurements. One okay. is a UBM or okay. ultra high uh, frequency Probe, the, probe, yeah. the mm -hmm. ultrasound probe which mm -hmm. we use and then take the measurements and then mm -hmm. uh, we do some scans and then check if they are suitable mm -hmm. and then we can do it. You can do it for most 
conditions we can treat up till minus 23 okay with uh, fecic iul so IUL. the range is quite high hmm from uh, like minus 2 to minus 3 to minus uh, 23 we can treat so okay. the maximum power i have treated is minus 32 Okay. Where we use a combination of two procedures. One mm. is biopsies, mm. where we put in an ICL and then later on correct the balance power on the cornea either with LASIK or smile. <laughs> so this is known as biopsies. So we can treat very high powers also. Okay. So sir, is there any criteria like the range of that anterior chamber depth? How should? Yes, the uh, anterior chamber depth has to be a minimum of two point eight. Okay. For putting an ICL, mm. but experienced surgeons. can put it even in a lower anterior chamber depth even 2.6 2.65 i have treated okay. because i have done almost about 15000 icls icls okay fake ki wells hmm. so if you are very experienced then you can hmm. but otherwise generally the range is fr- if it's about 2.8 hmm. then hmm. there's adequate space uh, to fit that to fit lens. The lens otherwise it will lead to otherwise uh, there can be uh, an increased vault and what we call narrowing of the angle and mm-hmm. secondary glaucoma okay so these are things that uh, we have to check mm. the procedure itself is quite simple we just put drops mm. through a micro incision we just inject the lens so it takes like a couple of minutes a couple of minutes to do the procedure okay so sir uh, there is one more uh, like issue that is cataract which is natural aging of that crystalline lens in the eye how cataract can be treated and what is cataracts for the you can if you can tell them in brief yeah what is cataract actually it's interesting cataract mm. is a greek word mm. it means waterfall so the ancient greeks thought that there was a bad humor or liquid in the brain mm. which used to descend in front of the eyes and cause blurring of vision <laughs> and that's why they called it cataract okay <laughs> so that's the kind of history but cataract is nothing but opacification of the natural lens so everybody mm. has a natural lens in the right hmm. it's about 19 to 20 diopters the power of the natural lens mm-hmm. and that keeps changing its focus okay so when you are when you contract your muscles inside the eye the ciliary hmm. muscles then the power of the lens increases and you are able to see nearby objects mm-hmm. in a relaxed state you see the distant objects so this okay. is um, how the mechanism of accommodation works hmm. so this lens as you age becomes harder Hmm. So after forty years, it kind of reduces its ability to focus, and that's why you need reading glasses. Hmm. And as you get older, above sixty years, then again, it's multifactorial cataract, genetics, environmental exposure to UV light, hmm. um, and uh, nutrition. Hmm. All these factors can cause opacification of the lens. Natural protein lens, it gets opacified. The protein gets denatured. and then causes blurring of vision and that is mm. what is cataract cataract okay so sir what are the treatment options for it cataract now the treatment the latest treatments you have different types of surgeries mm. so what is followed now you have small incision cataract surgery which is a manual surgery mm-hmm. it's a sutureless surgery mm-hmm. in the earlier days we used to do what is known as extra capsular cataract surgery where we used to make a very big incision 14 mm incision mm-hmm. remove the cataract as a whole mm. put in the intraocular lens and then suture the wound mm. with the sics a mm-hmm. uh, small incision cataract surgery you need to make a 6 to 7 mm incision mm. you make a tunnel which is self sealing mm. so that it doesn't need sutures then you extract the cataract as a whole and remove it mm. that is um one a particular type of surgery which is done mainly we do it in cams and where we have uh, high volume and you know mature cataracts where mm-hmm. it's easier to do this then the gold standard is what is known as phaco emulsification mm-hmm. phaco emulsification is a technique where you we use an ultrasound probe and through a small micro incision 2.2 mm to 2.8 mm we actually emulsify the cataract the cataract is broken up into pieces mm-hmm. and sucked out of the eye mm-hmm. and the capsular bag is left intact through which we put a foldable lens so mm-hmm. through the small 2.2 mm incision we inject a flexible foldable lens which mm-hmm. is made of acrylic or silicon mm-hmm. and this goes and then opens inside the eye it's actually 6 mm in diameter the optic mm-hmm. and it has got supporting haptics okay. they go and sit in the bag 
and replace the mm-hmm. natural lens. This is an mm-hmm. artificial lens mm-hmm. so that it focuses. Mm-hmm. Now, even the, these lenses, you have different types. We'll talk about that. The other procedure, the latest technology is laser cataract surgery. Mm-hmm. It's called FLAX, Femto Laser Assisted Cataract Surgery. surgery. FLAX. Okay. So many people gave it different names. Mm-hmm. They call, they simply call it laser cataract surgery or they call it... Um, robotic or semi-robotic <laughs> surgery, but it's actually not a robotic surgery in the real sense. Okay. There's no robo doing the surgery. surgery. So it is uh, only the laser which makes all the important steps of the surgery. Mm-hmm. The incisions in the cornea, it's a customized treatment. So it measures the cornea mm. and the cataract, makes incisions in the cornea. If the patient has astigmatism, you can make relaxing incisions to treat the astigmatism up till 1.5 adapters. Okay. And then the the opening in the cataract, what is mm. known as the capsulorexis, mm-hmm. this is need to be very precise. And mm. with the laser, you get the maximum precision. You get the exact size and shape, mm. circular uh, capsulorexis. Rexis. And then it cuts up the cataract into pieces. Mm. So it's easy to suck out the cataract from the eye. Mm. So it's very precise. And we actually did a study between phaco emulsification and laser cataract surgery. Hmm. And we found that laser cataract surgery, the accuracy improves by about 8 to 10%. Okay. In laser assisted cataract surgery. In laser assisted cataract surgery. So now I mainly do laser assisted cataract surgery, especially for premium intraocular lenses. Okay. Intraocular lenses, there are different types of intraocular lenses. Hmm. The standard is what we call a monofocal intraocular lens, which focuses only for distance. Hmm. So the patient will have to wear glasses if he wants to see intermediate and near. Mm. And uh, people end up wearing glasses all the time, progressive glasses. Mm-hmm. Because uh, today, in today's world, you need intermediate vision for your phone mm-hmm. or to see or to read, all that. So they end up with progressive glasses, wearing it most of the time. Mm. Then you have another category of lens, which is a multifocal lens or trifocal lenses. These focus for distance, intermediate and near. Mm. all three distances so essentially patients don't have to wear glasses Mm -hmm. in this also there are different types of lenses the diffractive lenses Mm. have rings in the lens okay so these rings diffractive rings can cause some disturbance at night the Mm. night vision is not very good so when you look at light you can have glare and halos Mm. big circles around light okay which can be uncomfortable especially people who drive at night we don't recommend these Lenses, okay. highway driving and all that. Mm. There is a new lens called the fed off or extended depth of field lenses. Mm. These lenses are monofocal lenses, but with an extended depth of focus. Mm-hmm. And uh, they focus for distance and intermediate. Mm. So because to, in today's world, intermediate vision is very important. Whether you want to see a phone mm. or you want to see your iPad or laptop. Mm. Mm. Uh, so the and the night vision and the quality of uh, vision is good with these lenses. Mm-hmm. So people who are driving at night, who are living an active lifestyle, who mm. don't want to wear glasses most of the time, then the extended depth of field lenses, the EDOF lenses, are quite good. Okay, because they can be independent from glasses for most of activities. But to read small print, they will have to wear glasses. Okay, so they need readers to read. If you want to be totally free of glasses. Then you have to go in either for a trifocal or the Femtis M plus lens. Okay. Uh, if you want a reduced dependence on glasses, then you can go for this extended depth of field lenses. Okay. So these are uh, now the lenses, intraocular lenses, which are mm-hmm. available. And depending upon the patient's lifestyle and mm-hmm. what they want, mm-hmm. what is the kind of vision they require after the surgery, mm-hmm. then we have a questionnaire. We talk to them and then take a decision on what type okay. of lens. So, so like uh, even the lenses implanted according to the lifestyle of the patient yes okay so sir like how this edof lenses work edof lenses basically they stretch the focus okay so any lens it focuses light to a point Mm -hmm. to a point focus so the edof lenses what they do is there is a little bit of change in the curvature of the lens okay they actually this is called spherical abrasion Okay. So they have some amount of spherical abrasion, mm. which actually stretches the focus. Okay. So because of this, they get some amount of intermediate vision. That's okay. how it works. That uh, in the center, they have that spherical abrasion. Yes, they have a spherical abrasion, which 
focuses light not to a point mm-hmm. but actually it stretches the focus okay. so it's like it a it gives light. that uh, yeah. range of vision range of vision yes. okay that's called so that. sir uh, is there any complications using these lenses complications as such whatever lens you use the procedure is the same hmm. the implantation technique is the same hmm. you have to be very accurate in what we call the biometry or the measurements we take measurements hmm. of the lens so we have very advanced equipment mm-hmm. uh, what are called optical biometers mm-hmm. to measure the all the surfaces of the eye the length of the eyeball and then there are formula which calculate what is the power to be used for that particular lens for particular lens yes. and for a multifocal lens to be successful mm-hmm. you have to be within 0.25 power power okay. for uh, spherical power and mm-hmm. cylinder cylindrical power within 0.5 okay so, so we have toric lenses also mm-hmm. toric lenses are lenses which correct cylinder mm-hmm. so if a patient has cylindrical power mm-hmm. then when he sees an object the object appears stretched the quality mm-hmm. of vision is not good Mm. so with a toric lens when you put in a toric lens this astigmatism or cylindrical power is corrected mm. so that you know the rays of light come to a sharp focus okay. and the quality of vision is good so in a multifocal lens you can have a multifocal toric or a trifocal toric mm-hmm. so then these are for patients who have astigmatism also along with cataract mm-hmm. and this corrects the astigmatism and improves the quality of vision so the astigmatism has to be within 0.5 for a trifocal or multifocal lens to work well okay so the measurement has to be very precise hmm. and uh, accurate okay so sir as far as you were telling that uh, these multifocal lenses or trifocal lenses they have that rings which causes halos or glares but they give spectacle independence to the patient yes. so sir what are the suitable patients for that see basically patients who are not driving at night huh. or not very demanding but they want full range of vision hmm. they want distance intermediate near hmm. they are not bothered about the night vision they are not doing any highway driving hmm. so these are patients who are su- and they want independence from glasses they don't want to wear glasses hmm. these are patients in whom we recommend these lenses hmm. so that they are free of glasses and they mm. can do all the normal activities people who drive actively at night especially highway driving we avoid these lenses because the night vision and quality of vision is not that good okay you may have seen what are known as frenal lenses they mm-hmm. were there before we used to put them on our tv screens to magnify mm-hmm. you know they had this uh, rings diffractive rings mm-hmm. so that's the similar kind of technology so okay. the quality of vision is not that sharp but you have independence of glasses so you you have a full range you can see distance intermediate and mm-hmm. so there is always a compromise mm. we have a saying there are no free lunches in optics mm. so it's physics mm. so we don't have a lens which can mimic the natural human lens mm. god so is there great. is some amount yeah <laughs> that god has created they we are looking for solutions mm. for an accommodative lens mm. but um, so far there is no lens that can change its shape okay uh, uh, as like, a patient kind of looks at distance and near okay so that's why we use these roundabout technologies to give them distance intermediate and near so okay. there is a little bit of compromise when you go in for such technologies <laughs> in <laughs> quality of vision night vision hmm but most patients i would say 95% of patients are very happy hmm it's very very important to assess the patient have correct measurements and to do a meticulous surgery and mm. then you get good results in fact my parents both of them i put in trifocal lenses okay um they are older they don't drive mm. uh, inside the mostly inside the house and they want don't want to keep searching for their glasses mm. and they are very happy and they are doing well okay sir as far as i care is concerned what do you think where indian industry indian ophthalmic industry or indian eye care industry is at global stage i think the indian companies are doing very well now mm-hmm. and uh, some of them are even exporting intraocular lenses mm. to places like europe mm. and they are being used there mm-hmm. um so some of the companies the quality is very high i am also on the advisory panel of few mm-hmm. of these companies before we used to just depend on imported lenses hmm um because we didn't have the access to technology to manufacture them here hmm 
बट नाउ ऑफ कोर्स वी आर वेरी प्राउड बिकॉज इन इंडिया मेक इन इंडिया इज वर्किंग देर आर सम कंपनीज विच आर मेकिंग एक्सलेंट प्रोडक्ट विच आर बींग एक्सपोर्टेड ऑल अराउंड द वर्ल्ड एंड बींग यूज बोथ इंट्रॉकल लेंसेज एंड फिकी काइवेल्स Mm. and uh, this is something the trend which is actually picking up but there are certain advanced equipment like the excimer lasers mm. and uh, femtosecond lasers which mm. we still are not able to make mm. in india mm-hmm. or the advanced microsurgical microsurgery um equipment like microscopes mm. so we have a, in our hospital we have a 3d microscope okay where basically you are wearing uh, the 3d glasses looking at the screen and operating okay and uh, we had the first global installation from zeiss okay for the 3d microscope mm. and i am a consultant to zeiss and i help them develop products also mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so we get, we have to depend on technology from abroad if we want to get the latest cutting edge technology but uh, many of the technologies are also available in india mm. they are of course available at a lower price mm. and what we are seeing is the quality is actually improving mm. and now the quality is almost on par with the mm. global some of them with the global companies okay so sir what's your take on that like collaborating with the indian manufacturers and taking that on global stage yes in fact i have a few innovations and patents mm. and i'm working with some of the Indian companies i have uh, worldwide patents on a new type of an intraocular lens okay. a capsulotomy fixated lens okay which actually uh, it removes some of the side effects of the normal intraocular lens okay you have what is known as negative dysphotopsia and sometimes mm-hmm. the lenses rotate the toric lenses mm-hmm. so this new design takes care of all those things okay so we have uh, actually now we'll be doing the clinical trial shortly okay once we get the permission from the drug, drug controller okay and um, hopefully we should be able to project okay. it on a global platform so, so uh, this lens you are working on um, is it the intraocular lens or it is an intraocular lens okay it's an intraocular lens it's, it's not intraocular. that okay, it's an addition to intraocular lens no it's an intraocular lens for a fake lens also we have some new designs okay uh, so there are a lot of in- interesting projects and like i said i have a few patents mm-hmm. for all these innovations mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, hopefully in a few years we will be able to bring it out okay so sir let's conclude our this podcast with the last question like what do you think where our ophthalmic industry will be in 10 to 15 years will india will be at that stage where we are seeing like these american companies are doing great will india will be there see if you look at eye care in india hmm see india has the highest number of blind people in the world hmm and most of this bl- uh, blindness is reversible and it is because of cataract hmm we have almost 9 million cataract uh, patients hmm who require surgery so there is a lot of demand but again the supply is less hmm most of these patients are also in the rural areas hmm. and they don't know that a surgery can cure them hmm. so there's illiteracy lack of knowledge hmm. also there is difficult to access eye care hmm. and uh, what is happening today th- what we see is that uh, there is a lot of investment coming in eye care hmm. so be- there are a lot of investors who are investing in eye care and a lot of chains which have propped up hmm. and uh, but these are commercial chains because the investors want profit so basically they are for profit so most of them are in the urban cities hmm. which are there in the urban areas in the cities and uh, almost every street has an eye hospital or eye clinic hmm. and they are competing for the same space hmm because uh, again the it's for profits mm. but uh, most of the blindness is in rural india and this is a problem mm. access to care so we actually have a trust called shraddhai care trust mm. where we do about 10000 surgeries uh, free surgeries every year we have uh, two base hospitals and we have buses which goes to the rural areas we do the screening there and we are also associated with the 
national uh, um, program for prevention of blindness, what mm-hmm. we call the NC, NPCB program or mm-hmm. the DBCS program, where uh, we are uh, coordinating with the government. There are a lot areas, rural areas, where we can go do the screening, bring patients and operate them. Mm-hmm. And we also have a lot of the NGOs whom we have tied up with mm-hmm. who help us in this work. Mm. And uh, we do about 10,000 surgeries every year, the free surgeries. Okay. And uh, this is something that we have been doing from 2000. Shraddha started in 2000. And then okay. it is a not-for-profit organization run by a board of trustees. <laughs> and this is something that, uh, again, the community service which we are doing. We also do school eye screening. Mm for refractive disorders and squint and other things. So this in India, this is there is a gap. Hmm. So we need to kind of fill the gap. And of course, equipment is expensive. Intraocular lenses are expensive. But now Indian companies also have started manufacturing. So this will actually reduce the gap. Hmm. The government also has taken certain initiatives like the GST for intraocular lenses were was mm-hmm. high and then they have kind of reduced it to 5% now, which is good. Mm-hmm. And if they can also kind of wave off customs on some of the equipment which are essential for surgery, because eye problems are huge in India, that will be very effective and helpful. Mm-hmm. So this is uh, where we stand. But with time, what happens is the load of this preventable blindness will come down. Mm-hmm. And um, of course, the Indian companies and the ophthalmic industry, we do, actually in India, we do the maximum number of cataract surgeries okay. in the world. Okay. So our surgeons are very experienced. Hmm. If you look at the developed countries, if you look at their operating list, they are like, they operate like two or three days a week. They do about four or five surgeries. Hmm. Here our surgeons do like 20, 25 surgeries a day. Hmm. So they are more so, practiced than they? Yes. We are highly skilled and mm. uh, we are very efficient in the workflow. Mm. And um, this is something which actually it is the need. So we adapt to that. Mm. But over a period of time, I think this preventable blindness would come down. But what we see is that I think more people have to actually do some amount of rural service and community service to reduce the blindness so that because the trend is now for investments and investment coming into eye care a lot of mm. investment coming into eye care and then only these commercial chains which are being set up mm. uh, so that is a trend which is not very healthy if you look at the overall picture of mm. uh, blindness in the country preventable mm. blindness where we need to kind of bridge the gap bridge the gap and then also offer uh, services to the mm. rural population and the underprivileged. So that's what we are looking at. So, yes, my life has been a bit of everything. Community mm. service, mm. research. We have more than 100 publications. Yes, sir. I've I read like few of them, like the lenticule extraction. Yes. It's on lenticule extraction, but it was a way more technical for yes, me. Yes, yes. <laughs> We have a lot of uh, publications on refractive surgery, cataract mm. surgery, and uh, we have training programs. Mm. We have a uh, lot of education, research and education going on. Mm. So it is a kind of a wholesome approach. And so I enjoy doing everything. So uh, it's about making an impact. Yes, it is about giving back also. Mm. And I always believe that you should give back more than you take mm. and that is fulfilling in life if mm. you are able to give back more than you take mm. and give something to the society and make yourself useful mm. and also mentor and teach your younger colleagues mm. so that they become successful i think it is very important it's about taking that younger generation forward yes you have to take everybody together mm. i think everybody has to pitch in everybody has to be successful also hmm. and uh, yes that has been my life's goal hmm. so that uh, so it's a saying also na, that alone you go fast but together you go far yes in fact the cornerstones of our practice we call it trick hmm. the core values hmm. teamwork Respect, integrity, and compassion. Hmm. So these are the cornerstones on which our practice has been built. Built. 
सो थैंक यू सो मच इट वॉज अ वेरी इंसाइटफुल कॉन्वर्सेशन विद यू थैंक यू इट रियली मेड माई डे